Okay, so this is going to be a breakdown, analysis, concept overview of these terrarium scenes that I've been making for the past few months. I'm going to show you how they're set up, how they're lit, the detailing and the overall workflow for creating a scene like this, as well as things like the post-process settings, setting up sequencer and movie render queue. And I'll also talk a little bit about virtual cinematography, composition, so you know, taking you behind the scenes as it were. Just as a disclaimer, this is not a step-by-step -step tutorial. It's going to be more of a broad overview, a big picture kind of thing. That said, I will link to some other fantastic tutorials and videos by other creators down below. These will dive into a lot more detail on some of the various topics that we'll be covering today. Links will be down in the description below. And as always, if you find this video useful, give us a like, drop a comment or subscribe to see more of this channel. So to begin with, setting up a scene in Unreal Engine 5 is a bit different to UE4, given that we want to be using Lumen for our dynamic global illumination. So our scene is going to be entirely dynamically lit. So do make sure that you go into your level settings here to the side and double check that for snow pre-computed lighting is ticked. If you're not super familiar with how lighting in Unreal works, I will at this point direct you to William Fauché's excellent Lighting Basics video, which goes into a lot more detail about all of the different types of lights, best practices, etc. It's well worth a look. But with these scenes in particular, the lighting setup is actually relatively simple. All it is is a single rect light, a skylight, and the emissive material built into the tank. That's it. The thing you have to consider with dynamic UE5 lighting is that it's remarkably similar to how you'd go about lighting a offline path traced scene in that your environment is taken into account when casting light. So that means that a good place to start when constructing your set is, well, by constructing a set, as you would if you were really filming an indoor terrarium in a studio with you know, physical lights and props and cameras. So in this case, I've set the skylight with a HDRI and turned down the intensity to about 0.05. This is going to provide uh, ambient light, mimicking that very faint bounce light you would get outside of your set. It's very subtle, but it just serves to highlight the edges of the tank, almost like a very faint rim light, in order to uh, separate it from the background. But we only want that light coming in from the front, not illuminating the back of the tank. So how do we do this? Simple. The same way you'd do it if you were filming this in real life. You'd get some black panels, foam core or cardboard, or even like a, a black top, and enclose your set to make a little cave of sorts. Here I've just got a basic plane loaded up with a uh, black material. Note that the specular value is set to 0.1. We don't want this costing much, if any, bounce lighting at all. And there, you have a suitably dramatic backdrop. With regards to the actual scene construction, it's fairly straightforward. A combination of mega scans and custom modeled assets were used for the bulk of the tank internals. Nanite is good, use it for everything that it can be used for. Uh, reference is essential for creating believable layout. One of the tricky things with this set of scenes in particular is the scaling. These are, of course, fully sized assets scaled down to fit a miniature scene, so it's important to maintain a sense of scale relative to the smaller size of the overall scene. In real life, of course, these are not naturally occurring setups, they're uh, hand assembled, so it had to feel like someone had manually put every rock and a tuft of grass into the scene themselves, which, of course, in a manner of speaking, they did. Well, I did. So, in terms of detailing, do consider that you're trying to achieve uh, a kind of visual camouflage with the way that you set up your scene. You're always trying to break up any visible lines and seams where the different assets meet. Decals are great for this, they add a lot of complexity to a scene without too much performance overhead, and you always want to be trying for that visual umami in your scene, it's just a lot more fun to look at. Here I'm also using wetness decals to add a lot of extra realism with fine control. So this is without having to mess around with every material and mesh near the water. Simply arrange to get wet assets. Also note that, of course, anything underwater stays matte, not shiny. Now, onto lighting the interior of the tank. 
Here we want to borrow a little trick from film and TV set lighting. As you can see here, the light strips are built into the tank ceiling. The tank I modeled in Blender, so I had total control over this. And the intention was always to have this central section be a sort of like a, a dripper for the raindrops. But I still wanted large, even lights for that bold, dramatic, top-down lighting. And while emissive materials do contribute to lighting in the scene with Lumen, as you can see here, it's not quite enough. Now you could go in and add four little rect lights arranged to match the light planes. But here we run into a little bit of a problem. It's both very bright in the highlights, but at the same time kind of dark around the middle. Keep in mind that this is not a path traced scene, so light will not bounce accurately like it would in real life. So you end up with this sort of uh, gloomy atmosphere in the middle with overblown light on the sides, which, you know, may be what you're after, but for this I wanted soft, even lighting across the entire tank. So what do we do? Well, we give it a little bit of help. If you've ever seen the behind the scenes from a TV show or a movie set, especially for an interior scene, you'll often see a lot more light than would be, you know, realistically possible for that space. But if you handle it correctly, you can get a nice, soft, diffused lighting that looks real, but isn't technically realistic to the scene. So a bit of movie magic here. So in this case, we just have to add one rect light spread out over the entire ceiling of the tank, which gives us this nice, soft light falling across the entire scene with no like overblown spots and no like darker sections. But this still lets us keep the highlights from the emissive material of the built-in light. So it's the best of both worlds. And with regards to the light settings, I like to keep it fairly low and just manually adjust the exposure to kind of suit the kind of scene you're trying to get. Now onto the FX. For the water, I've actually done a separate tutorial for that, which I'll have up here and link down below. As for the raindrops, they're fairly straightforward. It's just a hanging particulate Niagara emitter with a gravity force applied. For this one, because it's such an up-close scene, I'm using a mesh renderer instead of a sprite with a little raindrop model that I quickly sculpted in Blender and gave a basic water material. That way it looks nice up close and refracts the background as well as properly catching highlights on the way down. Do make sure that for the water material, that in the material settings, output velocity is turned on so you get a proper motion blur for your raindrops. Now, problems inevitably come up. A word about Nanite and how it plays with RTX. Spoiler alert, it doesn't really. As a general rule, if ray tracing shadows or GI is on, your Nanite mesh is going to have some weird artifacts on them due to RTX tracing off the Nanite proxy mesh as opposed to the actual mesh. However, if you have a chaotic enough scene that is well camouflaged enough, sometimes you can get away with turning on RTX reflections only. So not shadows, not GI, just reflections. And this lets you pick up some extra highlights and just make, make the scene pop a little bit more. Do note that Lumen Reflections will show GI in the reflections, something which RTX Reflections will not do. Also, if there are ever any sharp reflections and you're using RTX Reflections and Nanite, the reflections will kind of be ugly. Here, for example, I'm not too worried because one, the water is constantly moving, so there isn't really any chances to get a glimpse of clear reflections. And number two, the condensation on the inner walls does a good enough job of hiding any weird reflections from the mega scans rocks there. So like I mentioned earlier, visual camouflage, very good for many things, including hiding all the jank. Also from a material standpoint, if you ever have any problems with assets looking weird or not rendering quite right, double check your lumen scene. Anything black is not contributing to lumen GI correctly. So when it comes to actually capturing your shots, there are a few things to keep in mind. For me personally, I tend to already have a pretty good idea of what kind of shots I want to get before I even begin a project, and I will generally work towards getting those shots as I go. Of course, things change, and there's definitely a process of discovery and an element of adapting to what you have as a finished scene, but I do like to approach it as if I were there in real life, filming with a real camera. So there's a point where I kind of switch off from 3D artist and approach it as if I were a uh, videographer or a cinematographer and just try to capture 
shots as I get the scene, without necessarily changing too much else. Something I found super useful is this uh, video from Becky and Chris, awesome channel, you should go check them out. But there's this seven shot sequence that they use, which I found very helpful as a baseline for not just shooting these scenes, but for pretty much every scene that I've ever done. Do try and plan for the edit as well. What kind of shots flow well with each other? What kind of pacing do I want? The vibe, the mood of the overall scene. In terms of the actual camera settings for these scenes, because they were so close up, I shot quite high focal lengths, so 50 to 85 mil, sometimes 100, 120 mil. So it squishes the shot down and you get this nice bokeh for the macro shots, right? I do tend to prefer shooting 16 by 9 for YouTube, and I usually set it to 16 by 9 DSLR, usually at 1.2 or 2.8 aperture, usually 1.2. In terms of post-process, when I'm building the scene, I use a post-process volume. But when it comes time to actually capture my shots, I do like to switch to using the camera settings by themselves because it gives me a lot more freedom to try out different f-stops, exposures. So I usually turn the post-process volume off for capturing. For settings, I usually turn on motion blur to 0.5, chromatic aberrations usually set to around 0.04, vignette to around 0.4, a little bit of bloom and lens flare can be nice depending on the shot, but it's very easy to overdo it, so less is more. Now, in terms of camera shake, that's quite interesting. You can do it manually by creating a blueprint, but you can also get them from the marketplace. And I've really enjoyed using this one, which is actually just captured from real camera movements. I'll leave a link down below, but you can just track the file into sequencer and season to taste. Now, notes on exporting footage. I like the movie render queue, although I don't tend to super sample too much. I mean, for YouTube, it's, yeah, the default sequencer style is fine for me. When you're keyframing, do make sure that the first and last keyframe is set to linear interpolation, and that any keyframes in the middle are set to order. The depth of field debug plane is your friend, so use it. Although do note that it's, uh, it's a good idea to set the quality to cinematic to get a good idea of the real depth of field, as if, if it's on high, for example, it can kind of look a little low quality and you won't get the, the proper sort of blurring of the background, and it's hard to judge. As for settings, I usually render out to a PNG sequence. I don't tend to use linear workflow for YouTube too much, I know, I know, but for client work, sure, but I don't tend to find it matters too much after YouTube gets through with compression. Also useful to set your cinematic quality settings in the, uh, in the movie render queue before you go. So Unreal Engine 5 is definitely a very powerful visualization tool. Uh, one that gives even just a single artist quite a lot of creative firepower to work with. Do note that I'm not necessarily talking about games here. It's more from a CGI VFX standpoint. And in that case, UE5 can bring a lot to the table and enable very rapid workflows for 3D. So I hope that was a helpful little peek behind the scenes at, at the workflow. It's relatively simple, but once you get the hang of it, you can do a lot with not a lot.